After doing this for the US, Germany, Brazil, and a couple more, the United Kingdom. In this video, we're going to take a look at a few maps that teach us about the United Kingdom. The point of it is that maps are a good way to display information about whichever region they are displaying, both as interesting information about the whole nation or as a way to compare different territories or areas within it. We'll learn about nine things in this video. Territorial division, Brexit results and current polls, GDP per capita, national identity, languages throughout time, religion, protected territory, population density, and life expectancy. By looking at these maps, I think we'll be able to learn a little about how the UK is as a country in terms of the identity of its people, the differences between where they live, and some interesting facts about territory as well. Starting with the ones on the thumbnail. First, regions. The United Kingdom is divided into its constituent countries, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and England. Each of the first three have their own regions as well, but a lot of statistical maps show them together, while England is divided into its nine regions. The nine, as we can see on this map, vary a lot. The highest population is Southeast and London, each with just over 9 million people, while somewhere like the Northeast only has 2.6 million. And they vary on a bunch of other things which we'll see ahead. Although most of these maps aren't divided by region, rather by county, or even presented with the UK as a whole, but still I think it's important to know this division. Then Brexit voters. The Brexit referendum took place a few years ago now, but I think it's still interesting to revisit the results. The map on the thumbnail is pretty simplified, so here we can look at one with further detail. Although the general idea it presents us with is equivalent to the simplified version. The darker the orange, the more an area voted to remain. The darker the blue, the more it voted to leave the European Union. The first conclusion is that it was obviously a very close vote. Most tones are light. But we can tell two clear things. Northern Ireland and Scotland mostly wanted to stay in the EU, while Wales and England mostly wanted to leave. Although many urban centers, especially London, voted to remain as well. We don't have recent poll data in maps for this, but we do have it for the past two years in a chart. This data from Statista, a great source by the way, asks people whether they think they were right or wrong to leave the EU at the time the Brexit referendum was done. It seems despite Leave having won in 2016, it's been almost a constant over at least the past two years that people regret leaving, with most thinking it was wrong. Only in March of 2021 did a poll point to a general sense of agreement with having left. And something interesting is that, despite there being somewhat of a clear trend in which electorates of which part parties mostly supported leaving and those who mostly supported staying, this isn't that visible in electoral maps. Places that mostly voted to leave don't necessarily just vote conservative in their majority, and vice versa with Labour, Liberals or the Scottish party, showing us that this is a divisive issue for British people since the referendum up to today, but that their opinion is not only based on their political views, but apparently other factors as well. Wrapping up the ones on the thumbnail, GDP per capita. This map shows us which areas have the highest GDP per capita, although the data is from 2018, so a little outdated. The darker the blue, the higher the value. Urban centers have the highest, and these are mostly concentrated in southern and eastern England. Although some other cities have high values as well, like Liverpool, Manchester, the region in and around Belfast too. Scotland has a high GDP per capita in many of its regions, and only Wales seems to be left out of having a very high value in its regional capital. The UK government website I got this from shows something really cool, which is the evolution of these values from 1998 to 2018 so over two decades. And it's interesting to see that there seems to be a tendency of growth throughout the entire country. Almost never does a region go back to having a smaller GDP per capita than it used to have. Although keep in mind, GDP per capita doesn't necessarily tell us how rich each individual actually is. It just divides the total GDP of the area by how many people it has, not necessarily in the way it actually is divided. If a group of people has one chicken, that doesn't mean each of them gets one fifth of the chicken to eat. Maybe two of them get 99% of the chicken and the other three have to divide the remaining 1%. This next one is super interesting and it tells us about which national identity people in the UK mostly identify with, based on the 2011 census. The 2021 results weren't available yet due to the census not being complete. They have five options, Scottish, Irish, Welsh, English, or British. The results aren't surprising. Most people in Scotland consider themselves Scottish before anything else. The same happens, although slightly less, with Wales, as well as strongly throughout England. But two key details call our attention. First, London mostly considers itself to be British rather than English. Perhaps a great example of how it is successively seen as the capital of the United Kingdom and all of its constituent countries, not just England where it is located. But I think it has more to do with the international character that London has. Host
hosting people that move from all over the world to London because they want to be in the United Kingdom, not necessarily because they want to be in England. Also, the number of people who move there from what was at the time the British Empire territories throughout the world likely consider themselves more British because of that fact as well. In Ireland, some counties consider themselves more Irish, perhaps in support of unification, perhaps not, but many of them consider themselves British. In fact, I would say the majority based on this data. And this must be because of their support for union with Great Britain, thinking that defining themselves as Irish would mean they want to be united with the Republic of Ireland, while defining themselves as British assures they remain a part of the United Kingdom. Although it sucks we don't have more recent data about this, because it would be very interesting to compare this map with a more recent one to see how the latest years, especially going through the Brexit vote, as well as the Scottish independence referendum, would influence people's perception on being British or something else. Another cool map that is related to the identity of British people a little is this set of maps, which shows us the evolution of languages used in Great Britain and Ireland throughout time. It's fascinating to see one thing right away. Irish Gaelic is the only one that has lasted since the first map from the year 400. Back then, common Brightonic was dominant throughout, with Pictish being the most spoken language in Scotland. By the year 500, Old English began showing up on the map, and Welsh set itself apart too 100 years later. Scottish Gaelic began gaining importance by 900 AD Norse started showing up likely due to the invasions of the Danes. By the year 1000, the language divide mostly illustrated the division between the countries. Irish Gaelic in Ireland, Scots Gaelic in Scotland, Welsh in Wales, and English in England. Although Cornish, for instance, as well as Cumbric, was still present. But as we go through the following centuries, English begins an almost complete takeover related to the takeover of English control over the islands, first of Scotland, then of Wales, and then Ireland, completely forcing Cornish into disappearance as a main language as well. But the main detail is important, because despite English being the most common and dominant language in the UK today, many people in Wales still speak Welsh as well, as they do Gaelic in Ireland, Cornish in Cornwall, or Scottish Gaelic in Scotland. For this next one, I'm sorry, but we can't use a map and we need to use a graph instead. This is because Christianity is the dominant religion in every single area of the UK, at least at a large scale. And so a map would just look like this, providing us with very little information, only the percentage of people that are Christian, both Protestant or Catholic. The only conclusion is that Northern Ireland is the most Christian region and Scotland the least. At most, we can use this other map, although it's exclusive to England and Wales for some reason, which depicts the largest minority religion by council. There are two things, or rather colors, that instantly call our attention, yellow and green, Hinduism and Islam, respectively, which seem to be the most common in the majority of places. Red, Sikhism, is also somewhat common in these areas, around the center and in London as well, but in very residual values as we will see now, because the graph provides us with additional information and a clear image on both the weight of each religion in the UK, but also its evolution over the past decades. And we can see that Protestantism, more specifically Anglicanism, has been steadily declining over the last 120 years, from almost 80% of the population population in 1900 to about half of that value now. The reason why is also clear from the graph. While other religions, namely Islam, have increased a little, that's clearly not the reason why Protestantism has declined. Instead, that reason is the steady rise of people who say they have no religious affiliation. Surprisingly, Roman Catholics have maintained their level about the same as they were 100 years ago. If you know why Catholicism goes so much against the trend, let me know in the comments. Speaking of how the Catholics have been able to conserve their percentage of followers, what about protected areas? Get it because they serve the purpose of conserving the environment? Anyway, this very recent map from 2021 shows us all areas within the United Kingdom that are protected, both at land in green and at sea in blue. And I was surprised by how many and how extensive they are. I would dare say maybe 20 or 30% of the UK's territory is protected. They started surprisingly early in land protection. This chart goes all the way back to the 1950s, and since then, land protection has been increasing immensely, not to mention the gigantic leap that sea protected areas took from 2010 onwards. A good sign that the various governments over the past years seem to be taking into account the importance of safekeeping their land, their environment, and nature. But what about the areas that aren't protected, essentially where people live and work and where factories exist? Those would be the remaining territories. And something interesting about them is population 
density, meaning how many people there are per square kilometer in that region. This pixelized or rather gridded map shows us that data. It's interesting because from a population density map, we can not only see the areas which are most densely populated, but also the areas that have the most people. We get the clear notion that England is incredibly more populated than the other three constituent countries of the UK, with many of its urban centers being so big that they phase out around them in increasingly less and less densely populated areas. London is the best example of that, going from a purple core to red, orange, yellow, and then finally green. Birmingham, I think, is another very densely populated area. In blue, are the regions that are least populated with less than 50 people per square kilometer and some might match those protected areas we just saw. Cornwall has very few people, Wales even less with the only higher population concentration being in their capital of Cardiff in the south and up north where they might meet the extended area of Liverpool. Scotland is interesting because they essentially have three population density areas. The south which is basically empty, this middle strip which is very populated being very small and thus with a high density and then the north which is basically empty as well. Again, partly due to protected areas, but also due to the inhospitable conditions they present. Only Aberdeen and Inverness are small exceptions. In Northern Ireland, only a few regions make it into the green, very few in the yellow, and only the area in and around Belfast present a high population density. And finally, life expectancy and how it differs throughout the UK. It's divided between males and females, left and right respectively, but generally the good-bad results match, only varying a little. And through this, we can see in which regions of the UK life expectancy expectancy is the biggest. There are a lot of factors that can influence life expectancy, childhood conditions, education, socioeconomic status, lifestyle, access to good healthcare, among many things. We can't pinpoint which factors are lower in each of these regions, but we can conclude that one or more factors need to be necessarily worse or better if there is a variation in the life expectancy value. Maybe the GDP per capita information we saw earlier has some impact. If people are, on average, making more money, they will have a higher quality of life, with less stress, access to healthier food, which is often more expensive, and better healthcare conditions. If some regions have a higher level of education, maybe they have access to higher paying jobs, leading to all those benefits we just mentioned, among many other conditions that might vary. The first conclusion is that England, especially Southeast, South and East England, does best, with its life expectancy reaching almost 87 years old in some places, while Scotland seems to do the worst. Glasgow City, for instance, only has 72. It's also important to note that despite the good-bad results matching for male and female, the values differ a lot. For instance, the lowest male is 72, but the lowest female is 78, while the highest is 83 and 87, respectively. This is a reality in all countries in the world, not only in the UK. Women usually have higher life expectancies than men. So, those were a few interesting maps of the UK that teach us about the country. It's always difficult to choose which maps to use in these types of videos, and I had a particular difficult time finding interesting ones for the UK because the point is to do three things. Learn about the people of the country and their characteristics, such as religion or language. Learn about the country's territory, such as how it is divided, what it's used for, and where people mostly live. And learn about how different regions compare internally in some aspects. I think we achieved the goal of learning a little about each of these three things, even though the amount of information about them is essentially infinite. So if you want to learn more about the United Kingdom's people, its territory, and how it compares internally, let me know in the comments and I can always make a part two of this video with more interesting statistical and data maps. Thanks so much for watching this video. Subscribe if you want and I will see you next time for more general knowledge.